The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Now this is fairly similar and we're going to kind of touch on a couple different portions that I didn't have time to hit on the first one. But this is now a similar application, but this is now with gravity feed. So we're not using injection equipment. Uh, we're going to be using you know, gravity uh, and, and a reservoir, so a slight head pressure to force force resins down into a crack on a horizontal slab. Same basic agenda. The wrap documents kind of do line up very similarly for, for gravity feed and, and crack injection. And again, causes, and, and th these are a little different, but you know, they're, they're all major causes for cracking, but steel corrosion, freeze thaw, sulfate attacks, uh, alkali aggregate reactions, poor construction practices in general, improper joints, load imbalances, again, many others the ones I mentioned before, included with these. Now you notice that you know, some of these are a little bit different, and these are typically more susceptible on a horizontal decks because things can pond, things can sit on them, whereas on a vertical surface, it's much more difficult for, let's say, de-icing salts to just sit on the surface. So this is more typical to seal steel corrosion uh, and, and different types of uh, attack from chemicals uh, on a horizontal deck. But again, same, same reasons. We're restoring the structural integrity of the deck, and we can resist the moisture uh, penetration. In a vertical surface, typically that's going to be for a tank that we're looking at uh, resisting moisture intrusion. But for a horizontal, this could be, again, snow, sleet, rain, de-icing salts, uh, chlorides, carbon dioxide, uh, aggressive chemicals. Uh, the, cap, or the, um, the injection, or I'm sorry, not the injection, the, the resin, is going to form basically a seal now, or a plug, to uh, eliminate the intrusion of these types of uh, aggressive chemicals, and reduces, hopefully, further deterioration and any long-term deterioration after that. If we have horizontal cracks that are very defined, we could treat them individually. But in many situations, we just have a large deck with many, many cracks. So that's typically going to be treated as a whole in what we call a, a healer-sealer type application. Uh, and part, like I said, parking garages and bridge decks are probably the two main candidates for these types of applications. Very blown up picture, it's very old, but this is a, a, a roadway, a bridge deck, it's a timed bridge deck. And as you can see, this would be very difficult to treat every single crack individually. So we treat them as a whole. Again, proper surface prep, if we're doing individual treatment, same type of application. So wire brush, again, grinders are going to kind of force it in there. Pressure wash, uh, 24 hours, you have to let that dry because, again, it, all the water is going to want to sit in the cracks. We have to allow a sufficient amount of time. You can use the same thing, compressed air, vacuums. Uh, but for larger areas, which, again, this is more typical, shop blasting or sand blasting, and sand blasting has kind of gone out of, out of favor in a lot of areas these days, but shop blasting is the, uh, is the number one at, uh, prep application. Uh, for these types of decks. And then the V-groove, or the notch, is actually used a little differently here. It's, uh, instead of for deteriorated concrete, it's more often just used as a reservoir to allow a little bit of pressure and to basically give you somewhere to pour the, uh, the resin as it's being uh, sucked down into the, into the crack. Shop blast, so here's your V-notch. So again, just kind of gives you an idea of, of where to pour, and then you can kind of watch that and watch the resin uh, funnel down in there. So now, these applications are not just epoxy applications. Uh, they could also be typically uh, methacrylate or HMW, high molecular weight methacrylate applications as well. And there's, there's benefits and, and cons to both of those. HMWM is typically uh, lower viscosity and a lower surface tension. So you would think for finer cracks, you're going to have better penetration. Uh, and it's a little less critical on the mix ratio. But epoxies tend to be more moisture tolerant, whereas HMWMs are not really. And they're a little bit safer to mix and apply. Epoxies tend to be less than 100 centipoise, and HMWMs tend to be less than 50. So both have been documented in very, very fine cracks, but it really is going to depend on the applicator in those situations. So again, 50 centipoise, less critical mix, mix ratio, can be a little faster time to set or faster time to open to traffic. Uh, they're both very easy to pour, very, both low viscosity and both resin-based. Damp concrete is, is probably one of the major uh, benefits of epoxy, and it's a little bit safer and easier to apply than HMWM. Again, 881 is uh, kind of the governing document for choosing materials for these type of applications. The mixing equipment is going to be a little different. So 
For small applications, we're talking about mixing buckets, drills, and, and paddles. And then it's going to be typically a flat squeegee, uh, brooms or rollers. Sometimes, you know, it, you know, you can kind of get away with mixing and pouring, but for large projects, uh, you're typically going to want some type of uh, tank with a spray bar because you just it's going to be very difficult to get the material out fast enough, especially if you're using some, an HMWM. Then it you know then you can actually do by hand. So you're going to want some type of automated or semi-automated uh, equipment. So same safety again, it's very important to to, to wear the proper um, PPE. But one special note on HMWMs. They typically come in, in three or four components. Uh, and typically, two of those are an initiator and a promoter. If anybody's ever worked in, in, with these materials before, you know that you never, ever mix the initiator and promoter directly together. They will, they will combust immediately, uh, and you'll have a fire on your job site. So that is something very, very important, that you have the resin and you mix the initiator. And once those are mixed in, then you mix the promoter uh, after the fact. But you never mix those together. Uh, I've heard stories of people blowing off oven doors. I've seen you know, videos of fires on the job site that spread very quickly because you do have a flammable resin. So very, very, very important when using HMWMs. So now getting into the actual application. So we mix the resin. Uh, we didn't really talk about mixing the resin before, but we did talk about proportioning correctly. In this application, you know, a V-notch we talked about here to kind of build a reservoir but you can also use some type of sealant uh, or dam to uh, create a reservoir as well to kind of aid the, uh, the gravity effect. Uh, this is the proper way to mix. You know, he's got the drum, he's got the mixing paddle, gloves, PPE, respirator. This is not the proper way to mix. I don't know what he's doing or what he thinks he's getting away with, but it's probably going to end up as a mess. You don't want to mix like this or like this. Definitely not like that. That, I, I don't even know. So I always, my, my saying is always, the, there's nothing worse than trying to get to remove cured concrete than trying to remove uncured concrete. It just becomes a mess. And especially in these crack injection where you're actually gravity feeding, it's almost impossible to now get that uncured resin out of a crack. So make sure you mix. Make sure you pro follow the proper manufacturer's recommendations in mixing. Uh, once you've mixed, now you want to typically try to pour the epoxy as quickly as possible. Because again, you do have a limited working life, especially with HMWMs. So you want to pour, you want to apply it evenly, and you want to kind of pool it over the cracks. So when you have a single crack, you can kind of pour it into the reservoir and you can visually watch it as it penetrates in. So as it dries up, you'll pour more and you'll kind of hit the spots as you go. Uh, in a large application, you will use your squeegee to then kind of pond it over the cracks and, and again, kind of visually looking for any dry spots and just pouring more and more resin until basically it's saturated to, um, to refusal. Here's one application. I was supposed to take that picture out, I think. But in this application, they're doing the whole deck. So there's a lot of little fine micro cracks. So they're pooling and then brooming as they go. Here's an application where you can see, so it's starting to dry up a little bit here, so that they would then add a little bit more resin to that, uh, to that area. You typically have about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, with the HMWMs, that could be as little as 11 minutes. So it, it can be very, very quick. Signs of pop proper penetration are going to be air bubbles. Now, typically, people don't, they don't want to see air bubbles. But in this case, that just means the air is being displaced from the crack. So that's a good thing. Uh, and then dry spots, that just means it's, it's really saturating and it's really sucking up the resin, so you'll add more. Uh, and then lastly, you know, if, if required, remove the excess resin. Again, if it's, uh, if it's somewhere in a mechanical space that might get a coating, you don't necessarily have to do that. If it's never going to be seen, you definitely don't have to do that, uh, but sometimes it is required. And then in a large scale application, and even sometimes in, in individual cracks, uh, applying sand to the wet resin is, is a common occurrence. Uh, for, and for two reasons. Uh, in large scale applications, if you just have a deck that's flooded with epoxy, it'll be very slick once it's cured. It'll be like a glass. So you want to add a little bit of slip resistance. Uh, and then in small scale applications like for this, and if you're putting a coating on top, sometimes it's just easier to apply a little bit of sand so that you can ensure adhesion. Uh, if you're not coming right back over top of it with a, with a compatible coating and you miss that open time, uh, this just kind of allows you a little bit of extra leeway. And then again, finish smooth. So you can remove the sealant, excess polymer, if, if necessary. 
And again, kind of going back to the, uh, the evaluating, there's, uh, in, in, my, you know, in my opinion, the best way, again, is cores. Uh, and you can see, uh, under a blacklight, you can see exactly where the resin has penetrated. So you know, once you have the core out, it's very easy to tell if you've done the job correctly or not. And that's all I have for today. So if there's any questions. What kind of penetration can you expect on a 7,000 inch crack with just a gravity feed? And it's, uh, shot, uh, it's a sponge blasted, sponge blasted, which is kind of a. That you know. I would not be able to say for sure. But I mean, seven thousandths of an inch, I don't know, maybe an inch, two inches, three inches. I, I, I'm not sure. That's, it's a, that's, that sounds like a very fine crack, and uh, it's really going to depend on the resin that you use. But typically, I mean, down to you know, six thousandths, uh, it's been documented in a gravity feed application to, uh, to fully uh, penetrate. Full penetrate. But, yeah, it's, it, it's, that's difficult to say. All right, thanks. No problem. You had mentioned about putting a coating, so you said lay sand down in, into the, to the repair into as you put it on. Yep. Could you come back and put like a cementitious cap on that? Say like a clarifier floor where you wanted to come in and put grout in afterwards. Yeah. Do you expect any bonding issues? No, and then, and the sand would be a, a good uh, application for that too because you know I, I always think that a sand broadcast is a, is a very solid substrate for cementitious or epoxy or urethane type uh, application. So yeah, that would be uh, definitely acceptable. In the beginning, you mentioned. Uh, this is an application of treatment for freeze thaw, uh, cracked concrete. What happens to it once the, the freeze thaw process continues? Well, hopefully, uh, the, if you've done a good job, you have many years of uh, minimal water intrusion into the deck. But I mean, if, if there is still areas of, of the deck that are allowing water in, then it, it may not do um, it may not really uh, resist freeze thaw to that same effect. But if you've done a good job, you know you should have a very well sealed deck for for a number of years after the fact. And you may have to come back at some point and you know reapply or spot apply. But uh, you're really just trying to keep that moisture out of the inside of the deck. We have an overhead or uh, soffit slab uh, cracks. So many cracks. Uh, you in this they're penetrated case, from the top and the bottom. Overlay, yeah. So in that case, you would, um, you could, it's a, it could be an, uh, an injection application, or you could seal the bottom of the slab uh, with a cap seal, and then gravity feed from the top. But depending on the structural integrity of the slab in general, that could be a good candidate for uh, gravity feed, as well as injection, depending on uh, how bad it is. All right. All right. Thank you guys Thank very you much. Scott. I appreciate it. Okay.